Hello everyone, welcome to Manu Tapes. So a very special guest is joining us today, introducing you to a hairstylist who is specialized in fashioning and styling your hair as per your personality. She is someone who did not just found a niche in an art industry, but also has professionally grown and found success in the industry. We welcome Arman Abbas. Hi, how are you? Uh, well, uh, just for our viewers, because they are new, why don't you share us what a hair color is or a hair stylist is? Thank you, Batul, for uh, having me and for uh, introducing me to your audience. I think this was uh, something that uh, we should have probably done a little sooner. <laughs> uh, I think two artists from different fields coming together and discussing things. I don't think uh, I have ever done something like this before. So I think it's, uh, it's a very good chance for us to discuss how similar and how different the two fields are and uh, why hairdressers uh, like calling themselves artists so again uh, thank you and uh, coming to your question where you asked uh, what uh, or who is a colorist so the when we talk about hairdressing it's it's a huge uh, industry and uh, the spec the spectrum is uh, really big so we have colorists we have uh, hair sculpture which is basically hair cutting, then we have hair design, which is basically hair styling, then we have barbering, which is male grooming, then we have African hairdressing, which is a completely different ball game. So we have different categories when we are just talking about hairdressing. So hair coloration is one of them. So someone who specializes, who specializes in uh, hair uh, color, so basically working with hair and basic and working with the color would be someone who can be um, called a uh, hairdresser or uh, if when you break it down and are specifically talking about specialization then they would be called a um, hair colorist so how do you think it is uh, how is it very similar and yet different from artists that we paint like when i look at it we we use colors so how do you think this is different from art really, as a painter that's actually a very interesting question um which uh, I sort of get a lot because uh, I also come from uh, an art background. So a lot of people did ask me how similar these two fields were. Uh, I think um, an artist who paints, I, I, I don't want to say anyone's job is easier. Obviously, that is something that I don't think I can ever do. But I would say it's a little easier in regards with the fact that you can see what is going on and you can see uh, the process and so you have a clean canvas before you start and all the pigments that you're mixing all the colors that you're mixing are right in front of you so for us it's it's difficult because a we do not get a clean uh, canvas we we do not see things happening in front of us but uh, when we talk about uh, colorists uh, just if you're talking about the science of color and just the aspect of how pigments and colors work uh, and, and all the rules that we have to follow when it comes to uh, complementary colors and anti colors and things like that that is very similar that's actually it's exactly the same so i for example i would like to show you uh, this is something that we use that we call a color chart and usually at the back of it we have a color wheel like this yeah so as you can see this is literally the same color wheel any art student studies uh, while we are uh, learning color science. Obviously, you would have a more complicated color wheel because there are like a lot of um, there are more tones in different variations of these colors. But this is just something basic and to give you an idea how we also navigate uh, when we're talking about the challenges uh, that we feel while we're talking about complementary colors and we talk about anti-colors and we talk about 
which color can be used with the which color and which 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 two colors should never be paired or uh, when we mix two colors we get another color so primary colors secondary colors tertiary colors etc etc so that phenomena stays uh, the same so i think when we talk about the theoretical part when we talk about the basics and color science it's exactly the same but uh, while we are working uh, it's it's different for sure but it's like same but different at the same time for example when i look at it from mm-hmm. a painter's point of view i can see colors while i'm mixing it while i'm applying on the medium but when i look at this hair colors they cross see the paint the color that it would turn out to be not only that the customer who's coming here for the first time they would be looking at their turned out result at the same time as you would so how do you manage that first of all how do you manage a customer and how do you know which color is going to turn out at which level yes yes so like i was saying earlier not to say that uh, anything is easy but uh, this is a fact that obviously when you can see something uh it's the result is predictable but when we talk about hair and we talk about pigmentation and we talk about coloration and then we talk about artificial pigments it's really complicated it's uh i think it's it's a mix of mathematics and then uh, color wheel and color theory so as as hair colorists we are taught different levels and in those levels we are taught that there is a certain dominant pigment so for example like i said that when you start painting you have a clean canvas you have a white neutral canvas we when we are starting our work we do not have a neutral uh, canvas we actually have a warm canvas because uh, every hair has natural pigmentation in it which is warm so for example if we are talking about people who live in the subcontinent the dominant pigment that we have in our hair is red and for example someone who is naturally blonde someone with lighter skin tone and lighter hair color the dominant pigment in their hair would be yellow so when we are starting our uh, process we have to consider that so okay for example if i'm working on let's say base 4 which is again the dominant pigment is red so i know that i need to consider the pigment i need to fight it so that's an equation that goes in my mind as soon as i see the canvas that i'm working on and once i have done that the math 2 plus 2 is 4 that is when the color wheel and anti colors and complementary colors come in so to make it less complicated I'll just give you an example. So let's say you're stuck with someone who has hair like mine, which is very dark. It's a level 2. And I need to become a level 8. Yes, which is like light and blonde. So the bigger the numbers, the lighter you are. The smaller the numbers, the darker you are. I never thought I'd be using so much math in hair dressing, and that is one of the misconceptions that people have that you don't have to study or you don't have to know your basic science and maths. to become a hairdresser but trust me you even need to know chemistry someone when they get into hairdressing that's when they realize that how much work it takes so coming back to the equation so i so from level 2 to level 8 you need six jumps to get there so as a hairdresser i know that when i take those steps like six steps i go lighter the pigment that so this is all in my head this is all that i have been taught this is all that i have learned over the years this is all that i have seen how the color changes over the years so i know that by the time i reach level 8 the dominant pigment is going to be yellow so i started with red but the point where i'm going to go it's going to be yellow so that's the mental math that i need to do and once i get there and i know that yellow is going to be problematic if it is going to be problematic then i'm going to go back to my color wheel and see which color is the complementary color for yellow which is violet or purple and that's when i use that purple in my color it is a little complicated because obviously you need to know your pigments you need to know your levels you need to know your undertones to be able to completely understand this but it's the difference is literally a lot of times we eyeball it we assume based on how hair and pigment works 
and uh, a lot of times for someone like me like i wait till i get the lightened uh, result to be 100% sure what my mixing would be when it comes to my pigments so a lot of times is just stuff that's going on in our head and a lot of times it's something that we see in the backwash so it is a little more complicated than painting a canvas for sure so now tell me what is trending these days well uh, okay so trends are basically when when it comes to pakistan we are a little slow uh, when we talk about what's trending in hairdressing in general um i think it's the same with fashion uh, so with trends we, to be honest we don't really follow them a lot of people just want to do what they want to do and have a lot of restrictions so even let's say for example internationally when it comes to cuts uh, jawline bobs are a thing right now but over here in our market we want long hairs and we want layers and we want something drastically different but we don't want to be too drastic we want to do something that is approved by our family and our loved ones uh, so we have never really been uh, trend followers when it comes to uh, like as a community or as a country whole we do have some individuals that are usually rebels who do something different and everyone stares at them for following the trend but generally i don't really think that in hair dressing you know, we really follow trends but if you ask me like internationally there are darker warmer colors that people prefer right now we do have a lot of textured and layered haircuts even in bob a lot of people are going for a textured bob instead of just a typical a line or uh, just a straight bob so but uh, again yeah, a lot of texture and a lot of darker deeper pigments and healthier looking hair just in general so a bit of haunting question i want to ask and that is mm-hmm. do you think ai can take over your job <laughs> okay so i think ai is a very interesting topic it's it's something that i uh, i don't want to jump too much into but it does not scare me um, if uh, ai is going to take over by all means uh, that it's just evolution you know you you change you grow and humans are going to find a way to coexist with ai and if not then um, survival of the fittest i believe but uh, definitely definitely ai can uh, take over this niche i believe ai can take over anything so um, and if we are reducing human error by a huge margin i don't think it's it's bad because you know people do make mistakes and those mistakes can be very expensive not just financially but if you're going to burn my hair uh, then it's going to take me years to grow it back and I, see for a lot of people hair means a lot so if you are compromising it in some way it affects them emotionally it affects their confidence etc etc so if ai coming in the business a their consultation is going to be on spot like we might miss a few things ai is not going to miss those blind spots so and then while working the precision obviously how precise a human can be versus how precise ai and you when you add the robotic element to it uh, then obviously that precision is something that we can't beat but one thing that i feel obviously ai is also going to evolve and they are going to have a lot of emotions and a lot that that, that uh, one on one connection with people but till that doesn't happen i think uh, this one thing when we talk about the service industry i think it's very important to have that human interaction that one on one therapy sessions that you have with your hair stylist uh i i understand a lot of people do not like talking while working or a lot of people don't like bonding when they're getting uh pampered they just want to relax i think for those people that evolution is going to come faster and it will be easier for them to accept uh because they're not going to miss that human element but everyone else who understand how a service industry works and like a two way street might find it a little difficult might find it scary but uh, like i said if ai is evolving with us and it starts adapting on uh, this then totally 100% they can take over and uh, I, i i think we all have to be okay with something like that 
I feel this particular feel that you, that this hairstylist has. I don't think so. AI can take over it. I think this is very personalized. You get to know the customer one to one. You get to know what they want, and then actually uh, coming up to their expectation. Not only that, applying your expertise. It is very different. However, when it comes to painter, of course, I can see AI has already been taken over. Uh, so what I have noticed in these art industries where we have been. Uh, there are only few specific fields like there is art, there is fine arts, there is textile and industry and media. These basic five to six fields are there. So I feel, don't you think these kind of courses should be introduced because every artist wants to sink in in the society, but sometimes they don't find their niche in these given fields that are there, and they want to do something different. Maybe uh, if you look at it, uh, makeup designer and hairstyle. These are also one of the fields of fashion industries, right? Just like dressmaking. Even in media, a hairstylist and a cosmetic design, uh, a hairstylist or a makeup artist is equally uh, contributing in that field. Even in media industry. So, what do you think about it? Don't you think these courses should be implemented? Okay, so this question is very close to my heart uh, because I am someone who dropped out of. Uh, art school. I was a student at Visual Studies Department in Karachi University. I was doing my bachelor's in industrial design. Uh, I just had my thesis year left, and that's when I decided that my true calling was uh, hair. Uh, I think someone who doesn't fit in is always going to feel that. Ever since we were a kid, that is how it was for me. I never felt like I fit in, or and, and oh, it's like. You always sort of know that there's a, there's something not right, yeah. And um, I just knew that I wanted to be creative. You know, that was a thing and famous. Two things as a kid that I wanted. I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I want to be famous, and I want to be creative. I don't know about being famous, but. Being creative is something that then I pursued, and the first option, the acceptable option, was going towards art. I always wanted to be a dancer. Then I wanted to be a music composer because dancing was an option. I wanted to do something in music again, the creative side. That was more like a hobby. It could never be a, a profession. You know, you need to understand. Like we are talking about things more than twenty years ago. Yeah, right. When I was growing up and I was a teenager and I wanted to do those things, and those things were less acceptable as compared to now. So the only artistic creative outlet I thought that I had was enrolling into an art school. And when I did that, and I saw around me, and uh, it's like it's very limiting. Um, because art and creativity in general is not accepted and appreciated in our country, unfortunately. So it just felt very restricting. It felt like someone's putting me in a box, even though I was in an art school. And for someone who does not fit in, you you really can't put them in a box. So for me, it was very restricting, and I decided that I'm gonna switch. But I, I, I and I think it was pointless <laughs> doing that. But that is something that worked out for me. Dropping out, not completing my studies, is something that worked out for me. I would just um, anyone who is listening to this and anyone who is confused about anything. It's, it doesn't really just have to be a creative outlet. Uh, if you're not comfortable doing something or studying something that you're doing, switch and still pursue your studies. I I did drop out. But I studied really hard when it comes to hair and hairdressing. It's not like a oh because I was this. Person who didn't want to study, so I went into a field where I just had to do nothing. I just to pick up my share and start cutting hair, or just pick up a brush and start painting like a painter. Uh, it took years and years of hard work and like gruesome studying um, periods where uh, I I have had to study. So it's not like that education is not going to get you anywhere, or education is not going to help you. But it should be the right kind of education. It should be something that is going to help you. It is. It should be something that should get you somewhere. So, if things are not working out for you, let's say if you are uh, an, an artist pursuing your career in art, it will be a little easier to switch. To be honest, like we have been talking about how similar we are. Um, 
it would be easier because you would understand the basics of coloration um uh, but still it, it's it's a long road it's a long way that you need to go and um and the process would be what i also did and it was a great suggestion and i would also like to like pass it on is just make a pros and cons list and see how you feel about the field that you want to go for uh if it's let's say hair dressing and then the field that you already in let's say fine arts or textile designing or industrial designing or graphic designing and then see how you feel about them and then switch and if you do want to switch then i would suggest that when it comes to hair dressing instead of going to a salon and asking them to teach you you should go to an academy you should go to an educator someone who's trained to transfer that knowledge to someone else instead of someone who's trained to just do it there's a difference yeah a good student is not always a good teacher so you need to find a teacher you need to find an educator who can teach you hair dressing not just show you how to color hair there's a difference so just please be careful when you are going out and looking for something like that that those are the points that you need to look out for because we have discussed this uh, very deeply and uh, one last question before i wrap up is so currently i was looking at your page i died today you have lastly taught a quite a big batch of people do guide us if someone wants to learn directly from you how are they supposed to contact you so i'm the education head for an italian brand we basically so the parent company is hsa uh, it's an italian um, cosmetic uh, line and uh, they have three brands in their hair line uh, category which are silky noel and as you can see ezla goldex so i head their education department i teach at their academy our academy is located in tarik road your followers your viewers can find us on insta and on facebook and um, and they can get in touch with us we can give them all the information about the courses that we offer the workshops that we have we, i i do one on one sessions with people i do group sessions i do one day workshops so uh, if anyone is interested anyone wants to start their career in hair dressing they can reach out to us we have all the information up on our insta and facebook page they can be in touch directly with us on whatsapp and uh, we can go forward from there depending on what their background is like and what they would want to do in the future thank you so much amina for joining with us today and giving us your precious time it thank was you. thank you and as always amazing talking to you no really really thank you for having me but it was a great experience same, same. and uh, i'm glad i got, got to share this side of uh, art because uh, very few people understand uh, what hair dressing is and what it is uh, like to be a hair dresser so thank you so much for giving me a chance to come here on your platform and share my perspective and talk about it, uh, these things that the questions that you asked were br- brilliant so thank you thank you thank you viewers for watching manvi tapes if you have any questions leave the comment in this video bye 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 thank you so much bye guys